we've come to chapter 10 of Jeremiah, and as most of you might know, or might remember, it's called a Christmas tree chapter. <laughs> because, of course, the, uh, the way how the trees were worshipped in the uh, ancient Babylonian empire, as well as um, other, in other pagan societies, it is described right here. But all this practice that we're going to read obviously resembles so much the Christmas trees that people put up together every December or every January, because keep in mind that in Eastern Hemisphere, um, the, uh, the, the the Christmas is being kept uh, two weeks later. That's because of the difference of the calendars. So, chapter 10, verse 1. Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. So again, we specifically see that he is now referring to the whole house of Israel, of course, including the house of Judah. Here again, he's talking to the whole nation, to all of the tribes. Thus says the Lord, Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. Now that, of course, takes us right back to the law of God, brethren, as do all the chapters in the prophecy. They're actually telling you what is happening to you because you heard that the law said, do this or don't do that. So many of the verses of Isaiah and Jeremiah take us right back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus and Genesis. Of course, this one does as well, because God said way back in Leviticus 20, don't go to see how those nations serve their gods and say, that looks like a good idea. Let us make a Christian celebration out of that. Let us serve our God with those Christmas trees and those Easter rabbits, etc., etc. So once again, brethren, once again, God says, don't learn the way of the nations. Don't learn the way of the heathen. Don't be dismayed at the signs of heavens. Of course, the eclipses and meteorites and zodiacs, heathen people see those as more than heavenly bodies, brethren. So they worship them, afraid of their signs and planning every day of their lives by the heavenly bodies and the signs of the heavens. Just like people do today when they plan their lives by their zodiac sign and all that other, uh, all that other occultism anyway. You know when it says in the Bible that Israel worshiped host of heaven? The whole host of heaven Israel worship, that's what it means, you know. They worshiped eclipses, meteorites, sun. Sun was the primary object to be worshiped, of course. Sun god, Baal, you know, to such an extent it was worshiped that even the children, firstborn children were sacrificed to him on big holidays like Christmas, like Easter, like Halloween, yes. That, those are the holidays that go back, their roots are right there in paganism and God knows that. And today when I hear people say, oh, yes, you know, we know Christmas is pagan. Oh, yes, we know Easter is pagan. But look, we are not celebrating any paganism. We are celebrating Jesus Christ. Well, you can celebrate Jesus Christ all that you want, but those, those uh, holidays are pagan, period. Because God knows, God is omnipotent, He's all knowing, he's all wise, he's eternal, and he knows the roots of those holidays. Not only that, but he also knows what those holidays implied. As I mentioned to you, brethren, last, uh, last, last Sabbath, God knows that those holidays are dedicated to who and that they, and because of those holidays, how many innocent children were sacrificed and how many innocent people died because of those holidays and he does not approve christianization of that of, 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 of such pagan things and he certainly does not approve of this uh, constantine constantine christianity because constantine, constantine the great was the one who actually imposed the greatest abomination mentioned in ezekiel chapter 8 which is worshipping the sun at sunrise. That's exactly what the Catholic countries today do. You know, Catholic people, at least in Latin America when I wa where I lived for a while, they just go out on Easter Sunday and they just wait for the sun to, uh, to, to rise and they basically worship the sun. Ezekiel chapter 8 shows us that is the greatest abomination. So that greatest abomination, Easter Sunday, was instituted in Christianity by the under the auspices and by the authority of Constantine the Great. And just recently, we we we, we had uh, 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 we had a writing from Dr. Bob Thiel saying that uh, uh, Grace Communion International, Grace Communion International, now Protestant Protestant group that took over the former Worldwide Church of God, uh, is uh, upholding the uh, Constantine kind of unity, Constantine's ecumenism. Well, that is what it was. You know, Constantine was the first ecumenist brother because he. 
amalgamated, I hope I'm using the right words today, he amalgamated the uh, pagan practices and, uh, uh, and and mostly Christian terminology, so he amalgamated that into his into his religious system, which is today called Christianity. But basically, it is Constantine's Christianity. And as you know, I'm I'm still writing a book. I'm very busy these days, working around the library and cataloging my all of these my books. We're having some other troubles with uh, with some neighbors who are uh, pestering us, and uh, I'll speak about that perhaps at some other time. We've had some problems with the neighbors. We feel kind of hatred here. It is amazing. You would find it amazing. But we live. I live in a Gentile country, and I told you many times, living in a Gentile country is far more different than living in a in an Israelite nation. You know, in a neighborhood, when you bring when you bring light, joy, uh, when you bring life through planting plants, having four cats, uh, uh, you know, uh, having a neighbor's dog who comes here now. He seems to have returned. He ha- we haven't seen him for about three months. They have, they probably got rid of him. And he returned. Guess where did he come? He came straight into to my gate, straight into my house. And uh, you know, when you bring when you bring life, life and, and joy, and when people appreciate, some people appreciate that. You have, amazingly enough, you have hatred of uh, others who just basically hate you because you have brought all of that, because they want to sh- share and spread. Uh, uh, you know, darkness and, 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 and gloominess and lack of joy and whatever. And they want to be, of course, they want to be worshipped and they hate you because other people may appreciate you as well. So we are facing that, we've been facing that for some time and it, that has intensified in the last couple of months. But anyway, that's, that's when you live in a Gentile nation, by the way. Uh, but the point was, the Gentile nations were brethren Worshipping the host of heaven, and Israel was told by God not to do that. Israel was told by God not to do all the other abominable things. Why do you think, brethren, why do you think that the law of God contains all of those instructions? Do not do this, do not do that. Especially when you come to the book of Leviticus and you have, you know, do not practice fornication of this kind. Do not do this kind of abomination, that abomination. Why, brethren, is that there? Well, because all of those nations in the promised land that Israel was going to inherit, all of those nations practiced that, brethren. All of those homosexual acts, the sodomites acts, the, you know, sexual perversions with animals, all those nations were doing that, brethren. And that's why God said to the Israel, do not do as they, that. do not ask after their God, do not ask after their customs. But what Israel did, Israel did exactly that. Israel came into the promised land and they exactly came to see, oh, what a good idea. Let's make out of this custom a Christian celebration. Let's make out of this custom a Christian way of life. Christian way of life. So today's Christianity is exactly a copy of paganism and nothing more. And Constantine the Great was not the great, the first Roman Christian emperor. He was the, basically, he was the Constantine the Great pagan. That's how I called him. To the one, to the end of his life, he had the, the, the Pontifex Maximus, uh, a title. And I hope that, you know, sooner or later I'll finish this manuscript in Serbian and then we'll just, will try to translate into into other languages for a witness for a witness to this dying world so don't be dismayed at signs at the signs of heavens you know that's what god says because you know that is the way that the gentiles and the heathen are dismayed at these signs of the heavens including eclipses and dark moon or or, or blood moon and so on you have even people who are kind of keeping this the the, the, the sabbath and the, the law of god who are just mesmerized even by these blood moons and so on of course they there are others who are not keeping the Sabbath and the law of God, but they also are mesmerized by this, and they they, 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 they they impute those things, things that are not really in the Bible. So that's why Dr. Bob Thiel has to re- had to written several articles related to uh, to the blood moons, for example. So this verse, this verse is a good thing to say when people say that pagan things are okay, that they have been adopted for Christianity. Verse three, for the customs of the people are futile. Now, the Hebrew word for the customs is actually statutes. So, the, you know, the, 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 the statutes of the people are empty. Empty, you know. They're without any content, brethren. They're vain. You just feel that emptiness in their, in their, in their celebrations, you know. There's no substance to it, you know. So, what are those customs? Well, they're talking about religious practices, whether it is masses or Christmases. Christ masses or Easter's, whatever they are. Those are the religious laws of these heathen worships. 
the customs, the statutes of these people are vain. And that he illustrates one of the statutes of these nations that are vain. This verse shows trees made into idols, decked with gold. Evergreen tree is a symbol of eternal life. You may, I may have may mentioned that to you in the past. That's why it says under every green tree. When it says under every green tree, you practice your abomination. Well, that's exactly because they, you know, evergreen trees, they don't, unlike the other, other, other trees, their leaves do not turn yellow in, in, in the fall. Neither they, neither do they have leaves that would just fall off, fall, fall, fall off. So, you know, it's evergreen trees, so that it's taken as a symbol of eternal life, and it's used in religious worship. So when people get, those Christmas trees into their homes, what do they do, you know? They basically copy the pagan customs. And it then it continues, For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workman, with the axe. Now in Hebrew, it makes it a little plainer, because in Hebrew it says, It is but a tree which one cuts out of forest, the work of the hands of the workman, with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. And speaking of these customs, brethren, I just, just, just came to my, to my mind just to remind you, it's not only the customs, but the customs also develop uh, certain ideologies and wrong ideas. You might have noticed on my YouTube channel recently, uh, I've posted about 10 short messages on some uh, basic Bible doctrines, including what is the purpose of man, including what does it mean justification, what does it mean, you know, uh, salvation. Those are things that people just have, they just grow with, with, with such terminology, but they don't really understand what it is, or they have uh, myriads of wrong anti-biblical ideas. And I'm planning to post a few more of those. And then I'll just compile them into a text and it will be like a good handbook for all of you who just love to have written things. It's a good handbook because then you can, you can use it for your reference. You can always uh, be reminded of certain basic Bible doctrines and what they teach and what are, and what is the, 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 uh, the difference between the Bible doctrines and the doctrines of this world. And perhaps some of you may use it for, I don't know, for whatever purpose other. Perhaps you'll just share with somebody else. Perhaps you'll share it in a discussion. Or perhaps somebody of you, some of you have very beautiful voices. Some of you may go on <laughs> local radios, I don't know. And perhaps you present those things to other people. But I'll just, I'm just going to make a compilation of those uh, doctrinal, basic doctrinal, uh, messages. So you'll have it in both written form and in the, in the audio format. Because it's very useful to do to do it that way. Because you see, different customs also develop different arguments that people use and utilize in order to justify what they're doing. Now, of course, their 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 their, their arguments are non-biblical, of course, and we certainly know that. But it's good to have these uh, short reminders, and uh, it's good for our education. Because, as Herb mentioned in the opening prayer, the purpose of our meetings is to be educated, brethren. To be educated about the Bible, the purpose of our uh, roles in the world to come are to be educators, to be teachers and, and priests, uh, priests and kings as well. Some kings rule, but priests are there to teach people. That has been their role ever since we know from the Levitical priesthood. So therefore, we need to be educated about those things and we need to know and to have to have some clear understanding of those things if we want to enter into the kingdom of God. And uh, such short articles... Uh, would be very good as a preparation even for baptism for various people. So, verse 4, uh, they decorate it with silver and gold, they fasten it with, oh yeah, we already read that, and then we have a poor translation in the King James Version in verse 5, that's why we use New King James, uh, because King James, sometimes it has very good translations and sometimes it has very bad translations. But we are reading again from the New King James, and therefore we will just avoid that poor translation. Verse 5, they are upright like a palm tree, and they cannot speak. They must be carried, because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. Now some people interpret this to say, don't worry about Christmas trees in your whole house in December, it cannot hurt anyone. But brethren, what they forget what they forget is the spirit, is the spirit behind such a custom, you see. 
Because behind such a custom under those green trees, the little children were sacrificed to Baal, to the sun god. Baal was worshipped, you know, under those green trees. And the spirit remind, remain, remains there. You might remember that, um, how many years was it there? Well, perhaps three, four, I can't remember. The time is just flying by so quickly, brethren. And so many events are happening both in the world, in our personal lives. So sometimes I, I just lose the track of time. But anyway, it was several years back, you might remember, when we discussed about the demonic influence and demons, how they work. And you might remember that I instructed you to look and search around your ho homes and get rid of any and every occult thing or uh, or or, or uh, object that you might find. And yes, it brought very good results. I remember that uh, uh, Nelson family, there was an uh, occult ring in their home. Uh, I remember in some other homes that uh, some of you found uh, Harry Potter's requisites. Uh, somebody was going to give it back to someone, but then he or she forgot it. It was there in a drawer. I remember Sharon Pass, our lovely friend from New Zealand, she said, I wouldn't believe that. This, in this cupboard, cupboard, she said, I found this Harry Potter video, which we sadly gave to our son to watch when we were not converted, my husband and I, in the past. But you know, it's amazing how, you know, the sin, <laughs> sin can hide in our, our lives and we don't even, we are not even aware of it. So that was a good, that was, we were doing it during the, uh, during the preparation for the unleavened bread. So it was a good exercise. But brethren, the spirit behind, what people forget is the spirit behind such a custom of entering Christmas tree in your home or entering whatever occult in your home or I'm even horrified by, 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 by occult literature. Why should we have that in our home? Why should we have Harry Potter's book in our homes? Why should we have any, anything, anything else to do with, 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 with occult in our homes, brethren? We don't need that. And I advised you to follow the example in Acts. Just burn it all. If it's not possible to burn it, or if the situation is such that burning would cause some damage, well then, you know, grab, grab a rod, grab whatever, and just smash it into pieces. Destroy it, brethren. Destroy it. We don't need to have occult things around us. So we don't need Christmas trees in our homes. Because the spirit is... Yes, the tree itself cannot hurt anyone, but the spirit behind such a custom is evil, violent, demonic. What this verse, verse 5, says is, Don't have that eerie fear, suspicious feeling about these heathen gods that they are going to get you if you don't appease them. So, you know, bury your kinds in the corner of the house to keep the spirits away. No, 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 brethren. Pass your children over a fire to keep a fire out of your home. Don't be afraid of these customs of the heathen. That's what the verse says. Don't be that superstitious and fearful and worrisome. They cannot really hurt you, but they cannot do any good either. Now, how could you think a tree that you cut out of the forest <coughs> and put in your house in this manner, how can that be any good. You tell me, how can that be any good? But you can be superstitious about black cats or anything else. They cannot do evil, you know. So, we're not to be afraid of things that they're afraid. They're afraid of all kinds of superstitious rubbish. You wouldn't believe. If you lived in a Gentile country, you would realize that. Because many of you live in Protestant countries, and uh, as bad as Protestantism is, it is not so permeated with superstition. When you go to uh, uh, other countries like in Latin America, former pagan countries, you know, who are Catholics, there's so much superstitious things that they've retained in their culture. When you come to Eastern Orthodox, Orthodox Church, uh, and in the society in which I live, you can hear of all kinds of superstitious things there, just people practice because they're afraid if they don't do it, then God is going to punish them. Yes, they don't believe in God, perhaps that much. They might believe in some higher power there. They are not reading the Bible at all. They're not educated about anything from the Bible. But, you know, but they're just permeated with superstition. Verse 6, Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is great in might. So now, uh, Jeremiah contra uh, contrasts the living God of real power with his helpless pagan worships that cannot do any good at all. And gods are trees. Gods are heavenly bodies. Gods are superstitions that can be that can be 
uh, cannot be any good, you know. So uh, they cannot do any good. They cannot be any good anyway. And there is always that contrast. We're not to be afraid of all those superstitious, stupid things and customs that people do. And to be afraid of things that they're afraid of. Verse 7, who would not fear you? Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? Is God just a nationalistic God, brethren? Is he only the God of the tribe of Judah? No, of course he's not. He is the king of the nations. But you know, a lot of arguments that people have against the Sabbath, against tithing, against holidays, they say, where, why? Those are just nationalistic, you know. Those are just for the nations of Judah or for the nation of Israel. But interestingly enough, when God gave the Ten Commandments, it was Elohim, universal name for God, Elohim. Uh, unity in plural. Even in Hebrew, <laughs> perhaps Jews would not admit it, but even when it says, uh, you know, the, the, the central Hebrew prayer is Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hear, O Israel, you're the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Uh, that very noun, one, is implied one what? One family, one community. Because God is Elohim, He is of course one God, He is one family. He is one family, one community into which endless number <laughs> of God beings can be born. So, yes, indeed. Uh, people say, oh, these are, you know, these are the, the customs for, 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 uh, you know, for nationalistic, for Israel, or whatever. But interestingly enough, again, when God gave the commandments, He was Elohim. See, it was universal name for God. And the same way happens again and again and again. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? So they have the queen of heaven, brethren, and we have the king of heaven and the king of the nations. Nobody fears that God, that God until they really know who he is. For this is your rightful, rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like you. So yes, you can look into Buddhism and Hinduism and any ism and whatever you want and there is none like God as a living being who is spirit, who has power and character. He is not like a tree. He is not like an animal. He is not like a river. He is not like a heavenly body. Why do I say a river? Because brethren, some nations worship rivers. Nile was the sacred. It was a god. Nile was god and worshipped by the Egyptians. Today, what is done in India is the Gang, the river Gang, is worshipped as the mother Gang. It's so terribly polluted, but nevertheless people believe that the uh, holy mother Gang, you know, cleanses all the uncleanliness, so they basically have a ritual to go and cleanse themselves in that, that so-called holy river. So yes, people are worshipping even rivers. And among all the wise of the nations, there is none like real true God. Verse 8, but they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Well, you know, those idols just appeal to people's human nature, really. The songs they sing in those religious ceremonies, they make them feel good. They don't change them. They don't praise God. They, people don't notice the difference of songs of the Bible compared to the old Protestant hymns. The ones we sing are praises to God. They're hallowing God's name. They're reminding uh, God of His promises. But what about the songs of the world's religions? Well, they say, I did this, I did that. You know, in most of the Protestant songs, you are the subject of the song. You're literally making yourself feel better even though you don't change a bit. You come out of those churches and feel better, but you haven't changed a bit. If you go to church every Sunday, you kind of feel better, you know. So you come out of the church feeling better. You see the other people on the streets that didn't go and, uh, you know, you feel better than them. But that didn't change you a bit. And that is what God is getting across here in this verse. All these customs or statutes of the heathens, they're all together dull-hearted and foolish. They... The very stock of them is the doctrine of vanity. And then, or the doctrine of vanities in plural. Then verse 9. Silver is beaten into plat plates. It is brought from Tarshish. Ezekiel chapter 27 verse 12 talks about the same thing. 
and gold from Ufas, the work of the craftsmen, and of the hands of the metalsmith, blue and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skillful men. So you see, most of those gods of stone, bread and wood, are clothed as you see in those parades of heathen practices, whether it is from China or Japan or whatever it is. Verse 10 says, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. You see, He didn't die like an evergreen tree died. He didn't fall apart like a stone does. He did not flake away like gold and silver did. In contrast to a tree made into an idol, there is an abomination for almost 6,000 years for which the people will be punished. At his wrath the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Well, you don't need to worry about the fire god or rain god, goddess of fertility, and all of those heathen superstitions and practices. We should never be afraid of them, but ignorant, unconverted, blinded people are. The eternal wrath, eternal wrath is going to cause the earth to tremble. <coughs> so they don't need to have eerie superstitious mystery. His indignation is seven last plagues, which are the wrath of God. The first four trumpets are actually the supernatural interventions by God on the earth, annihilating life. The nations will not be able to endure it. They're going to fall, to be conquered. Now, all of a sudden, verse 11 is in a different language, in Chaldean language, brethren, whether that is because it is a note of Jeremiah to the king to warn his people of what, it was, to co- of what was coming. Those who believe in sacred names would have you believe that a certain language is sacred. And to say God in any language other than Hebrew is wrong. So they go around saying Yahshua, Yahweh, etc. But the odd, th- odd thing about this, that is, if you saw God's name as uh, YHVH, the holy name of God that Jews would not even translate, then how would you know how to pronounce that Yahweh? How do you pronounce the vowels? So they called him the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter God. And that name is so sacred, they won't even write it. But you see, part of the Bible is written in Chaldean, part of the Bible is written in uh, in Aramaic, part of the Bible is written in Greek. Now, what do you do? You throw all that out and you have to speak in Hebrew. Now, Daniel has written in Chaldean. Now, this is not the pure and holy language. The people have some nutty doctrines, you know. That is really a that that is really a weird one. So here is a whole verse written in Chaldean, apparently from Jeremiah to the king, telling him, "You are responsible. You better wake up these people." Verse eleven: Thus you shall say to them, "The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens." You see, but that letter to the king didn't do any good because the king did not listen. Verse 12, He has made by earth, the earth by his power, he has established the world by his wisdom, and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. So here is again the three-fold summary that God uses all the way through the Bible. Now, is that all that he did? He doesn't say anything about the animals, plants, or, or men, or anything else, because that is just the threefold summary. We remember Proverbs 8, when wisdom was personified, when God did all that creating. So that, that proverb types exactly in with the scripture, and everything is balanced. You know, everything is in its place and survives joined with others. Verse 13. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapor to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, he brings the wind out of his treasuries. Everyone, verse 14, is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by an image, for his molded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. Well, just like those idols and those religious practices are dull and hearted. They are dull hearted, so are 
the men that follow those customs, brethren. They are just wood and stone. They are futile, a work of errors. In the time of their punishment, they shall perish. Now when Christ, com- when Christ comes back, they are all going to perish indeed. Verse 16. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the maker of all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Gather up your wares from the land, O inhabitants of the fortress. For thus says the Lord, verse 18, Behold, I'll throw out at this time the inhabitants of the land, and will distress them so that they may find it so. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is severe. But I say, truly, this is an infirmity, and I must bear it. My tent is plundered, and my cords broken. My children have gone from me, and they are not no more. There is no one to pitch my tent anymore, or set up my curtains. So you see, God is looking down on his punished countries, and they are desolate. For the shepherds have become dull-hearted, and have not sought the Lord, Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. And it seems that we are seeing that rendering today. All the flocks being scattered. I'm very surprised by the number of people who haven't joined any churches. Like who contacted me as former members of WCG, whom I addressed in one of my messages on my YouTube channel. I was very impressed that they're still there. They say they're just, you know, usually following what is being said here and uh, what is re- what is posted on my channel. And... Uh, that's that's about it. But uh, they're scattered, brethren. They're scattered all over the place. Flocks to be scattered, that is what is going to happen to all of those Christian churches as well as the others. Flocks will be scattered anyway. The flock of God of true people is scattered even now. And to the degree that I can influence them positively to think and to remain faithful, I've been doing that faithfully through my channel. I'm surprised because my channel was meant to be a vehicle to preach the gospel to the world and uh, address people in the world. But little did I realize that uh, a good portion of old former WCG members who have not affiliated anywhere are still there. And I'm encouraging them to endure and to stay faithful to God if they ever want to, you know, visit for, 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 for services or for, for uh, you know, having some fellowship, that's okay. We accept them as brethren. But uh, it is not good to be by yourself, and it's when a man or a woman is by himself or herself, he or she can very little accomplish in the in the vineyard of the Lord. That's why God has community. That's why He has holy convocations. That's why He is called, you know, He is Adonai Echad. He is one community, one uh, one group of people, one community dedicated to serving the Eternal, and you know. F- uh, being qualified to inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, Behold, the noise of the report has come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate a den of jackals. Now again, and again, we run across that the power that is going to punish the modern house of Israel is going to come out of the north. Verse 23, uh, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Now, this is what Jeremiah could see in in himself. You know, you, you just cannot know within yourself what is the real truth and who is the true God. Why are you there, here, etc., etc. We have to have God reveal that to us. We have to have a higher authority. We can never just sit around with with you know our nature and figure it out it would never it would never come to it so you know you sit around with your nature and you just uh, meditate and oh, and all of a sudden you figure it out well no it doesn't happen that way verse 24 oh lord correct me but with ju- with justice not in your anger lest you bring me to nothing no so you know when we pray for correction we better we better add that that we be you know corrected with mercy, with justice and or with judgment. We better, you know, because 
You see, God is a living being who feels angry, who feels sadness. God is a, God is a perfect balanced personality. That's what we want to be as well. And to do that, you have to be able to get worked up, get emotional, and yet be stable, sound, and solid. Verse 25. Pour out your fury on the Gentiles who do not know you, and on the families who do not call on your name, for they have eaten up Jacob, devoured him, and consumed him, and made his dwelling place desolate. Now this is yet another proof, brethren, of the inspiration of the Bible. Here is an imperfect man who was calling upon God to destroy those nations. Any hero of the Bible will we read about in the book is human. So is Jeremiah here. Because all Bible characters made mistakes. They all sinned and they all had to battle with their nature. So like the people they led or worked with, uh, you know. So otherwise, how can they understand them? How can they have mercy on them? And for them? And you know, that is why God had to have Christ come down. Because Christ had to be tempted in all the points as we are. That is why he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, says the Bible. That is why God lets us live after we are converted, brethren, after we have God's spirit, so that Christ could say to us that he had the same nature he had to battle with when he was in the world. So don't expect me to zap you when you stumble and then and make mistake. And, you know, we have to be careful with judgment because what judgment you judge, you will, you will be judged with. So we also see again and again God revealing himself through number four. Indeed, through number four. There are four things here described about the destruction of the house of Jacob. Uh, so when God reveals himself in Jacob's punishment, look what they do. Eat up, devour, consume, and make his dwelling place desolate. Four things are specifically given. So God is revealing himself in that punishment or judgment on the house of Israel. Uh, let's proceed to chapter 11. Let's read that chapter as well. We have enough time, I would say. In chapter 11, verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying. Now, that, the statement here is interesting because the word here is singular, indicating that this is a specific prophecy singularly about one. Now, who is the one? Well, he tells us in the next verse. Hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, the men of Judah is one country, not two countries, not twelve countries, not the twelve tribes. It is one country. There were Levi Levites and Benjamites mixed with them. No wonder, but the sword is singular, and this is a prophecy referring to Judah alone. Uh, let's see. Now, even today in Judaism, if you were born in Jerusalem, you partly had atoned for your sins. You know, being born in, Jew in Judah was the next best thing. You atoned for the amount of your sins by living in Judah. It's like the Catholics, you know. You just get dispensations and uh, you get <laughs> indulgences anyway. God says, you know, speak to the uh, men of Judah. Now that is just the average man of the country. But then above them, speak to the upper crusts of Jerusalem and say to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. Now here is an interesting thing. You know, some men in the past, when they tried to disprove the truth about the house of Israel, they said that were, when you read Ezra and Nehemiah, remnants of the ten tribes are all included there. So, you know, the country of Judah is all 12 tribes. They just came back from Babylonian, Babylonian, uh, uh, Babylonian captivity together. After all, were not, were they not side by side in their captivity? No, they were not as the matter of fact. They were 150 miles or 240 kilometers apart. 
But those theoreticians say that Assyria and Babylonia were side by side. Well, for some reason, God tells us in the Bible the towns where they were taken captive so that you know we can look it up on the map. So we see that the ten tribes were not side by side where Judah was taken. Some of those say that the same that the name actually Israel is used in Ezra and Nehemiah even more than the word Judah. Well yes, the word is used in the term the Lord God of Israel. Now does it mean that there was Israel there because God is called the God of Israel? Well he is you know here is a good disproof of that. Look at the verse. It is the word singularly about the Judah only. And yet he addresses it as the Lord of Israel. That does not mean that uh, had to include that, that had to include all twelve tribes. Now this verse goes right back to the law, just as all promises in the Bible do. The reason you are going to be punished is because of what you do or didn't do against or by the law. So, you know, you cannot do away with the law. No, you cannot do away with the law. If there was no law, there would be no punishments for breaking it. The very existence of the prophecies is, as such is a proof that the law is not done away with. And by extension, what is going to happen to the modern house of Israel because of the disrespect for the law of God will be, it will be, the punishment based on the law. So, no. No, no, there is no way that the uh, law has been done away with. All those punishments are listed in, listed directly in the law. Now, Christian world, of course, perverts God's word. They use Galatians 3.10 to show that the law is done away with because it says, far as many as care for the works of the law are under curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who works, works uh, 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 the law, you know. So, uh, what is going to happen to the modern house of Israel because of their disrespect for the law of God? It will be the punishment based on the law. There is no way that, you know, the law has been done away with. And all those punishments are listed directly in the law. As I told you, you know, in Leviticus... All those punishments, if you do that, something will happen to you, you know. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the list of curses and blessings. The brethren, all those horrible things were listed there because Israel could see them in other nations. All those abominable customs and abominable deeds were indeed practiced by all those people, those nations that live in the promised land prior to the return, uh, prior to the, uh, uh, you know, coming of the Israelites to inherit their full right land that belongs to them is promised from God anyway. But you know, all those customs were there. The people, so contrary to God's instruction, looked up those customs and they created their own perverted Old Testament religion. Today, we have perverted God's word, so Christian world perverts God's word. And again, they use Galatians 3.10 to show that the law is done away with. Galatians 10.10 Three ten, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And you know, at the same time, they leave out, they leave out not, not believe those who keep the law are under curse in Deuteronomy twenty seven verse twenty six. Well, what a twisted logic. Verse four. Which I commanded your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do according to all that I command you, quoting Leviticus 26, so you shall be my people and I'll be your God. And yet in this verse, brethren, we read about the blessings for keeping God's law. Verse 5, That I may establish the oath which I have sworn to your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this as it is this day. So you see, going right back to Deuteronomy seven twelve, and if they did not obey God, that milk and honey, they would turn into a land that would spew them out. 
And I answered and said, So be Lord. Now people, brethren, are like the Jews. They can pretend to be all that they want to be God's people. But if they do not obey God and do commandments, it is just a show. So before Jeremiah had to go and tell them this, he first had to say, So be it. You're right, God. Your judgment is fair. You are just. Verse 6, the Lord, Then the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. So you see, this work was going on in Jeremiah's day, but we may have a work as such to do in Judah and Jerusalem of today. You know, they never did the covenant. They claimed they were the converted people. They were covenant people and they preserved the covenant. They recorded it. They did everything. They, they, but, you know, they, they did everything but do it. Fulfill it. That is all that counts. To do the covenant. Verse 7, for I earnestly exhort your fathers in the day I brought them up out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting, saying, Obey my voice. So the very first day they left Egypt and they wanted to go back. Verse 8, yet they did not obey or incline the ear. Their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his evil heart. Therefore, I'll bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but which they have not done. And the Lord said to me, A conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So it was not just human failings and faults, but they conspired against you know, God's way because it was too tough. Verse 10, They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words, and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant which I made with them. Well, yes, indeed. They broke the covenant. Now what has always been the iniquity of the fathers from the time they left Egypt? What well, what has always been? Well, they had they had their own gods. They went after other gods to serve them. In fact, both houses did that. It is pointed out here even though this is a specific prophecy about Judah. But in the past, both houses refused to obey God when they were still one nation. And from time to time, of from the time of Jeroboam on, the house of Israel also had broken the covenant. Now, there, was, there has always been one covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not numerous covenants. Israel always served son, and God said, you know, they brought that with them when they left Egypt. They have always broken that one, and they have always broken the same covenant. Verse 11, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will surely bring calamity on them, which they will not be able to escape. And though they cry to me, me, I will not listen to them. Now, that is so-called going beyond the time of repentance. You know, you can go too long and they cry out to God, but, you know, he will still, he will still not listen. Verse 12, Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gates, to the gods of, to whom they offer incense, but they will not say, they will not save them at all in the time of their trouble. So you see, that singular prophecy comes right back to that one country. God looked back to the time when he was working with both houses, both houses of Israel. So they'll spend wealth and put trust in wrong things. You know, they put trust in pagan gods, like a modern house of Israel, puts trust in military weapons, in materialism, in their own ingenuity and history. Verse 13, For according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, you have set up altars to that shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. You see, brethren, they had gods of every purpose and every time and even for every street. We repeatedly read 
about that because it is uh, mentioned quite a few times in the prophecy. They worship the sun, the moon, and the zodiac. How ridiculous. Verse 14, So do not pray for these people, or lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble. Now therefore, you know, don't pray for these people. It's too late. Even if Moses was there to plead for these people, or Sam, if Samuel was there as, to, as he interceded for Saul, there is no there is no pleas any more for there is no pleas any more for people. There will come a time when we will cease to pray for people. Indeed, verse fifteen. What has my beloved to do in my house, having done lewd deeds with many? And the holy flesh has passed from you. When you do evil, then you rejoice. In other words, how can you claim to be God's people when you live this way? She has done lewdness with many. Ezekiel 16 verse 25 and 26 is a parallel scripture. How lewdness and adultery start? Well, it is with fornication and adultery, and then it goes on and on and on, and fornication gradually leads to lewdness. High places are everywhere, as it says in Ezekiel 16.25, high places where the spiritual lewdness was occurring. Holy flesh was offered to idol if the idol was sanctified. Now, it is not uh, human flesh, but sacrificial flesh that became holy in the ceremony. Verse 16, the Lord called your name, green olive tree, lovely and good of good fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it, and its branches are broken. So, you know, Paul talks of Israel being by nature an olive tree. Gentiles were the wild olive tree that were get grafted into the to the tree of Israel. So the truth about the house of Israel is not done away with. And as far as I'm concerned, brethren, it will not be done away with. It will never be done away with. I reminded the congregation today in Serbia that we are part of a Philadelphia remnant. A Philadelphia remnant of God's church, of the church of God, has the key of David. That's the only church here that has the key of David. And uh, because it is, we are a remnant of Philadelphia, we are to, supposed to know the key of David. We're st- supposed to understand the uh, truth about the house of Israel. We're supposed to understand the, their true identity, their, their their current location, how they got there. It is true, and it is uh, it is good to find heraldic various heraldic uh, proofs for what we claim. But in any case. You know, the truth about the house of Israel is not done away with. It will not be done away with. Even though there is a, in some circles that still call themselves churches of God, they have the, uh, this, uh, how shall I say, well, they, they, they say nothing about the house of David. David and uh, the, 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 uh, the throne of David, nor do they preach about the Israel. So it's not done away with, you know, in many places, but it's being, it is not being preached either. Verse 17, for the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. You see, God planted Israel where he wanted now he is pronouncing the, the evil of both countries. Both countries followed the same sun worship, the same paganism. Verse 18. Now the Lord gave me knowledge of it, and I know it. For you showed me their doings. But I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter, and I did not know that they had devices, and they have devised schemes against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be remembered no more. You see, Jeremiah did not know what his job was going to be. In the future, we will be like a docile lamb, not knowing what, not knowledgeable what, what was going on. Now, later we find that even his family wanted to get rid of 
Jeremiah as they were embarrassed by him. That's written in chapter 12 and in verse 6. Now, we can only apply that to Jesus whose family did not believe in him. Now, aren't our families embarrassed by our religion? Don't forget verse 19. We are going to be like a docile lamb. Jeremiah did not know that they were devising things against him. He, you know, we have no idea what are they devising right now against us, even the closest family members. John says they will think they're doing service to God. Verse 20. But O Lord of hosts, you who judge righteously, testing the mind and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them for to you, I have revealed my cause. Now, you know, the eternal tries mind. He tries also hearts, brethren. That's how we get to the bottom of our heart. Sooner or later, God is going to expose us what is in our hearts and minds. Verse 21. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the name of Anathoth, who seek your life, saying, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. Now, every man in the Bible has his opponents. Every time God raised a person to warn the people and tell the truth, Satan raised one to contradict it, even refute it and refuse and confuse others. Now, this is Jeremiah's hometown, so the time... You know, the same happened to him. Those people wanted to kill Jeremiah and shut him up because he was exposing them. He was embarrassing uh, them by choosing, uh, exposing their idolatry and their paganism and everything else, you know, is empty religion. So, you know, they were embarrassing, embarrassing the, the exposing, the, the, the embarrassing elements of those who were exposing their idolatry and their paganism and their empty you know, religion. So these conspirators got together with his family to do away with him. Now Jeremiah was not safe in his own area. So he sent he sent a message telling him not to prophesy so that he would not die by their hand. Now these people didn't come back, they were not spared in captivity. Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts verse twenty two Behold I'll punish them the young men shall die by the sword, their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. And there shall be no remnant of them, verse 23, for I will bring catastrophe on the men of Anathoth, even the year of their punishment. You see, so uh, even the year of their punishment, and then the time is coming. How to explain this? Well, the time is coming, brethren, when they're going to say, just shut up and get out of here. Don't prophesy any longer. Like in Amos chapter 2 verse 12. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets saying, do not prophesy. Shut up. We don't want to hear of this prophecy anymore. We don't want to hear any more bad news. If you have any prophecy, go down to Judah and tell them. Maybe they'll listen. There are kind of people that might listen to you. But the very family, the very home host, people, hometown people of the priestly city, they sought his uh, life, they tried to shut his mouth, or else he was going to die by their hand. But look what God had to do. You know, if God sends a prophet, brethren, and tells him what he has to do, then it is his job to protect him, and he can say it. So, Somebody that stands up to oppose directly the person God raised up to do his job, to do a job, whatever job that God has for him, they're just exterminated. There shall be no remnant of them. We see that God numbered their days right down to the very year. When that year of visitation comes, unless they change, none of them would survive.